don't have anything else to do but go to bed tonight, and they do that after midnight. So, you know, many times. I want to present to you tonight the man of God for this hour, for this camp meeting, for this congregation, for right where you are right now. Hear the man of God pray the word of God. Would you welcome Dr. Terry Trammell to us tonight? Yet moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were 
stone. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God had provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Wherefore, seeing we also were compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. From my study and exploration of the letter to the Hebrews, there are two major themes to this book, and I want to use one of them for the title of this message. One of the themes of Hebrews, I think, is this clear admonition, you cannot go back. You cannot go back. We've been having a wonderful time worshiping the Lord, at least, uh, you know, uh, around uh, the, the Lord's Word, I would say. At least I have. Some of you seemingly have res responded. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, as preachers, we uh, uh, we just preach to ourselves in one sense. And, and uh, I thank the Lord for this glorious truth that He's given us, His Word, and these 27 books that make up the New Testament. Have you ever wondered why 27? And why those 27? And how did a book get in? And what kind of books were excluded? And it's fascinating to study that process. But I will tell you, you might have heard or you might think, well, there were a lot of books that were considered and, and you know, and some were kind of folded in and some not. But that's really not the way it happened. From the time that these New Testament books were composed and began to be circulated, they were authoritative when they were preached and taught and they were shared with others. It was over about the 3rd or 4th century one of the early church councils in essence ratified those books that already had emerged to the status of being Scripture, that is the authoritative given by God's revelation and message to humanity. For a book to make it into the New Testament, there was really a threefold criteria that it had to meet. It had to be written by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle. It had to be written early in the first century. And then thirdly, and perhaps most important of all, it had to be harmonious with all of the other books that had been written and those that would be written after it, as well as harmonious with all of the Old Testament. Now with that kind of criteria, you can see how all kinds of writing will automatically be excluded. And then you think, well, what kind of process was it? Well, as I said, when these books began, when they were written and they began to be circulated, I think they just rose to acceptance in the church community. You know what, I've said to some people sometimes, you know, you, you, you don't really have to have a committee together to get together as sports people and, and have a committee study it for a couple of years to see whether or not Michael Jordan was one of the ten best basketball players of all time. You don't need a committee to decide that. His game evidently just elevated itself above almost everybody else that ever played. You don't need a music committee to get together and, and spend weeks discussing it and saying, you know what, that fellow Beethoven was pretty good. No, his music just elevates itself above almost anything else that has ever been composed. And you didn't need really any kind uh, of approval or committee. These New Testament books, uh, by their very nature and by their very composition and configuration, they easily was recognizable as being different and distinct and inspired in a unique way, they were Scripture. Now, of all of those that uh, we could look at, though, Hebrews, Hebrews is the most challenging because of this one thing. Um, it, uh, it, it was written early. I'm convinced of that. I, I, I believe it was written before A.D. 70. And uh, the reason is because all the way through, the writer is trying to show 
that uh, Christ is superior to the Old Testament sacrificial system and the temples destroyed in 70 A.D. And if this was written after 70 A.D., the writer certainly could have said, you know, the temple's even destroyed. The religion is, is uh, you know, in, in ruins. So in all likelihood, it was written early. But we do not know who wrote Hebrews. We don't know who the author was, the human composer. Now that raises a question, doesn't it? If a book had to be written by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle to get into the New Testament, how did Hebrews get in if we don't know who wrote it? Well, some people think they know who wrote it. Some people think Paul, the apostle, wrote it. And uh, others say, no, it wasn't Paul. It was maybe an associate of Paul. Maybe it was Barnabas or Luke. Maybe it was this one or that one. And there's all kinds of, of speculation. Um, I, I remember sitting in a, a church service. My wife and I went to worship at a local church in our area a couple of years ago. A pastor friend of mine was preaching. You know, I, I'm just sitting on the edge of my seat when I go to church. I don't know about you. I just can't wait till the preacher gets up. And then whatever he said, you know, says, turn with me to this book. I'm, I, I'm excited like a little child at Christmas. And he said, turn with me to Hebrews. And I'm excited because I love Hebrews. And so read the text and began to preach. And the pastor it just got started. And he said, when, when what Paul was saying here was this. And I leaned over to my wife and I said, I don't think Paul wrote he Hebrews. You know what my little wife said? She didn't say anything to me. She gave me one of these, right? <laughs> don't talk to me about such things. I'm getting ready to hear from him, right? And the Word of God. There was a, 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 an early church father, as it were. He kind of got off into a little heresy, but a man named Origen probably got closer than anyone to telling us who the author of, of Hebrews was. He said, only God knows. Only God knows. We may not know who the human author was, but we know without a shadow of a doubt tonight who the divine author was. Called the Holy Ghost moved on holy men, and they wrote these holy books. And the, the anonymous authorship of Hebrews was not enough of a factor to keep it out. The question was not, how did Hebrews get into the New Testament? The only question is, how could you keep it out? Because it was so harmonious. It is so harmonious with the rest of the New Testament. And not only that, but it's harmonious with the Old Testament. And you can't really understand and fathom and grasp a lot of the Old Testament Unless you get to Hebrews and read it, you say, oh, it all makes sense now. Thank God for this letter to the Hebrews. Now, we do not know who the author is for sure. Some of you preachers and all after, afterwards at the canteen, you'll try to convince me it was Paul. Others will say it wasn't Paul. And, and that, that's been going on for a long time. One thing we can agree on, though, we know who the audience is. And he... He, the author, is writing to the Hebrews. Now, you say, how do you know? Because all the way through, he's talking about things related to the Jewish religion and the Jewish faith. doesn't have to explain any of it. just assumes that the writer fully is, fully, that the audience rather is fully aware of the Old Testament and all of these things we've read about from uh, the Pentateuch to Malachi. Now, the, the writer is, is writing not only to, to Jewish people, but the writer is writing to a particular group of Jews, evidently. You have, to, you have to read through the whole letter and see this, but the writer is writing to a group of Jewish people that have already accepted Jesus as their Savior. They have embraced the Christian faith. They have said yes to the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the writer is not writing, you read through Hebrews, he's not not writing a letter to try to uh, to influence or introduce people to, to Jesus. He's writing to people that have already embraced Him, but evidently are giving contemplation and thought to going back. Now, we don't know the exact time frame. It may have been written somewhere close to 70 A.D. Persecution in many parts of the, the, the Roman Empire is beginning to, to emerge. We mentioned last night, Paul... Both Paul and Peter are going to be executed in Rome around 67 A.D. Persecution breaking out throughout the empire. And it may be that a, a number of these 
converts to the Christian faith that were devout Jews raised up until they heard the good news of Jesus, they are actually contemplating, thinking about, giving up their relationship with Christ and going back to Judaism. Going back to the Old Testament sacrificial system. And there are two major things, as I said, when I read through Hebrews, that stand out on every page. And one of them I said in the title, you cannot go back. That's what the writer said. You cannot go back. And the second thing is this. You can't go back because there's nothing to go back to. Jesus Christ is greater.
But the writer of Hebrews says, Under which angel did he ever say at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee? Under which angel did he ever say, Sit on my right hand till your enemies are made your footstool? There are no angels that are on the same level as the sinless Son of God. And the writer starts out saying, He's greater than all of the heavenly host. You get to chapter 2, the writer says, We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we've heard. Lest at any time we should let them slip. For how shall we escape if we neglect or abandon so great a salvation? And all the way through this letter, there's those warnings along with the admonitions. There's those warnings. You cannot leave. You cannot go back. How are you going to escape if you abandon the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ? We see Jesus made a little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor. And all things have been put under His feet. And He is the captain of salvation. That's what the writer said in chapter 2. When the writer gets to chapter 3, he said, consider the high priest and the apostle of our faith. We hear a lot about apostles. And we know about the twelve. We know about Paul. And we know about those that have apostolic ministry. But this writer said there is one apostle that is higher than all of them. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Apostle, by definition, is the sent one. One who is sent. And the reason that Jesus is the greatest apostle is because He came the farthest. He went from the highest heaven down to this lowest earth. And He accomplished the most. And He did it all in sinless splendor. And right there in chapter 3, the writer said, He is greater than than Moses. Now you, what would you have done if you had been reading this letter and you're thinking about this? For a devout Jew, that's almost a fighting word, isn't it? <laughs> Greater than Moses? That's what he said. And here's the logic. The writer says, Moses was great in his house, but he was great like a great faithful servant. But he said Jesus is greater than Moses because he was not just a servant in the house. He was the very son of the living God. Oh, I'd love to think about Moses and talk about Moses and preach about Moses. And one of these days I'm going to preach about the mountain top meetings of Moses because he climbed up Horeb and he met God at the burning bush. And then he climbed up Sinai. And he saw a glimpse of the glory of God. And he climbed up Pisgah one day. And he looked over into the promised land. And then he climbed up Nebo. And God came down and just loved him to death on the mountain. And then one day he appeared from heaven on Mount Hermon. And he's there in the transfiguration. And yet this writer has the audacity to say, There's somebody that's greater than Moses. And it's Jesus. And you can't go back. You can't leave Jesus for Moses. They had all kinds of priests that they had had for centuries. But the writer says you haven't had one like this one. He's touched with the feeling of our inheritance. He was tempted in every way that we were, yet without sin. You don't have a high priest like this one, but this one you can approach him boldly. And you can obtain mercy and find grace and help in the time of need. He's greater than the high priest. When you get to chapter 5, he says he's greater than Melchizedek. He has an eternal priesthood. He's already entered as a forerunner for us. We have a hope. It's an anchor of the soul. It is Jesus, this, this heavenly high priest. You get to chapter 6. There's another stern, strong warning that it is impossible, he said. If anyone has tasted and been enlightened and tasted of the things of God, if they go back to renew them to repentance, that, that's a, a very strong passage there and perplexing to a, a lot of people on, on different sides of the Calvinist Wesleyan equation. But here's the logic, people. It's very clear. The writer's not talking about someone just going through a kind of a backsliding phase. He's talking about apostasy. He's talking about someone that abandons the faith completely. He's talking about someone that leaves Jesus Christ and goes back completely in another direction never to come again. The reason he said there's no repentance, do you understand it? Can I say it any clearer tonight? If you leave Jesus, you're leaving the only salvation, the only hope, the only help. There is no repentance when you abandon Him. We 
must go up to him. Well, the writer's not finished. He's just getting started in chapter 7. He said he's the surety of a better testament. In chapter 8 said he's the minister of a better covenant. In chapter 9 says he is a more perfect tabernacle. He said he appeared once in the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He said he's now appearing for us in the heavenlies. And then he said unto them that look for him, he's going to appear the second time without sin.
The analogy is like a museum or a great gallery. You've read it, haven't you? By faith Abel, by faith Abel, by faith Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Jericho falling, Rahab. They did all of these exploits by faith and by their faithfulness. Have you spent some time there? Have you looked and seen? Why is the writer saying all of these things? I think he's telling his audience, you can't go back. There's nothing to go back to. we got to keep a hold of Jesus and looking towards Him. But look, others have already proven glory. That you can do it. You can finish well. You don't have to go back. You can succeed. You can, you, you can uh, be a, exemplary in your life. And that's the message of Hebrews 11. Now, if we had time, we could walk through all those portraits. But where I started the reading, I have to confess to you there... In verse 32 is one of the most humorous verses to me in the New Testament. Because the writer says, and we've mentioned all of the heroes of the faith, and, and for a Jewish audience, people that are contemplating going back, and they've just heard about Abraham, and Sarah, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and Joshua, and Rahab, and Peter. But the writer then says, And time would fail me to tell of these. And just starts mentioning Gideon's and Balaam, Jephthah, Samson, David, and Samuel. You know what's humorous to me? It's almost as if the writer just getting carried away with all of these examples and realizing, you know what? I got to draw the line somewhere. It reminds me of a of a pastor, uh, you know, preaching on Sunday morning. They've already told you they had five points in the sermon, but all of a sudden, a little before twelve, they look at their watch and they've only covered one or two points. And they say, let me just throw in the others here at the end. You say, well, that's not what happened. I think it is because he says, I mean, you know, entire fails me to tell about David. He threw King David in with Jeff Dodds. Nobody thinks it's funny with me. All right. It's a tough crowd at Piney Road tonight, but that's all right. right? Time would fail me to tell about. And the writer realizes, I can't. Call every example by name. I can't mention them all by name. But said, I can tell you about them by companies. And so he said, and then there, there was a great company. Mentions the first company. This group stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, waxed valiant in the fight. This first group won every battle. They won every fight. They didn't have a spot or a scratch or a scar or a stain upon them. And they were victorious and vigilant and valiant. And, and the writer just says, take a look at them. They also have finished well. And they're in the grandstands of glory. And, and we salute them well. Then the writer says, and others. Did you hear those two words? And others. People, whatever you do, don't forget about the others. Because there was a second group that he mentioned. The second group wasn't near as fortunate as the first group. This writer says they were beaten. They were mocked. They were stoned. They were sold asunder. They were made destitute. They were made to be vagabonds. They, they, uh, they were persecuted. They were beaten. They, uh, they uh, were, were made as, uh, as the dregs of the earth. But you know what the writer said? He said this second group had the same faith and the faithfulness as the first group. And he said of whom the world was not worthy. You know what that's telling me? It's telling me it's some through the water and some through the flood. And it's some through the fire, but it's all through the blood. And there's, there's sometimes the Lord takes us out of suffering, but there's other times He takes us through suffering. And whether you get delivered out of it or whether you triumphant in it and through it, at the end of the day where you want to find yourself is a place in the heavenly grandstands of glory like the Hebrew writer saw right out of chapter 11 into chapter 12 and says wherefore for because of that seeing we're encompassed with such a great cloud of witnesses who are these witnesses evidently it's who we've just been talking about those who have been the overcomers oh it's not just Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Jacob and Joseph but it's that company that, that waxed strong and valiant and triumphant and then it's also the martyrs and those who are faithful in suffering but he's saying to the readers, look at them. Look at them. People have already run their race. They've already finished. They've already stayed true to Jesus. You don't want to go back. You want to win like they did. And take your place in the heavenly grandstand. And 
then we get down to the last two verses of the text I read to you, and that's the application part. Since we're encompassed with such a great cloud of witnesses, the writer said, let's lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Yeah. And let's run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the sin and is set down at the right hand of God. Not only can you not go back, people, how many of you found out? We don't need to be looking back either. It's impossible to run when you're looking back. David Livingston said, I'll go any direction for God as long as it's forward. And I believe that ought to be the battle cry of every child of God. We're to run this race. We're to run this race with patience. And this is what that audience needed. And I think it's what this generation needs to know as well. How many of you have found out? You've got to have a made up mind. If you're going to see this thing through, you and I are going to need some stick to itiveness. I know that somebody asks, is that a word? If it ain't, it ought to be. Stick to itiveness, determination, patience. I want to know at Piney Grove tonight is there anybody that's in this thing for life? Jesus. Now this is 
significant to me. Did you catch it? The writer has shown them. He went way back even to Abel and Enoch and Noah before the Jewish race began. But then Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. But the writer is very clear. You don't run your race looking to them. You run the race looking to Jesus. Amen. We cannot run the race even looking in the crowd. Cannot, cannot run the race looking in the crowd. We've got to keep our eyes upon Jesus because He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He not only designed the course, He came down and lived it and showed us how to live it. And He finished His course with great victory. He endured the cross. So we're going to have to endure some things. He despised the shame. We're going to have to despise some things. But He did it for the joy that was set before Him. And He finished and He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the writer writes on a couple of more chapters, but that's the message of Hebrews. You cannot go back because there's nothing to go back to. And I ask you tonight in Piney Grove, does anybody have a made up mind like that? I'm in it for keeps. There's nothing to go back to. I'm, uh, I'm in it for keeps. Now, I want to end with some illustration applications. I've given you the Bible, the theology, the truth of the Scripture, but I want to do just what this writer did. He gave the theology, the warnings, and the admonitions all the way until he got to chapter 12, and then he introduces the analogy of the race that they were all familiar with. Hundreds of years before Christ, the Olympic Games were taking place in the in the palestras and cathedrals and coliseums, and, and so... The audience is very well aware of that. And I want to, to just leave you with a couple of illustrations of application for us in light of this message from Hebrews. I remember as a boy, I didn't watch, haven't watched much in the last several years of, of Olympic uh, game competition on television, but as a boy, I remember some scenes that I saw unfold in those kind of uh, contests that have indelibly been kept upon my mind. There was one race that, uh, that uh, when I was a boy, there was a, an American by the name of Dave Wall that was running the race. It was a longer race, and he had an unusual strategy. He didn't look like an athlete. He wore a, a ball cap when he ran. He was tall, and he was thin, and he didn't look like all the other specimens, but he had his own strategy. You know what he did in one of those longer races? He never liked to jump out the front. But he kept himself and made certain he had stamina for the end of the race. And he liked to hang in the back of the pack until they reached that final time around the track and they rang the bell. And when they got to the bell lap, they call it, all of a sudden he'd saved up something for the end. And here he came every time. He would pass one and then another and then another and then another and then another. And finally he crossed the line and he won the gold medal. I've been thinking about him a little bit lately. You know what? If you and I have anything we've saved up for the Lord, or we're saving up for Him, I'm telling you people, now's the time to give our best performance. The end of the age is upon us. The time of all things is now at hand. And it's time for you and I to finish well and finish strong. And I'm calling on you to, to move from in the back of the pack, as it were, and say, I want to get on the front lines of somebody that my community, my workplace, my school, my family knows. You know what? Not only am I a Christian, I'm not going back. I'm in it for teeth, and I'm going on with Jesus. You've got to do that. Now, let me give you two other illustrations quickly. And that is, this is where I, I wanted to say to you, because I, you know, the, the message is easy for us to, to say, well, you, you know, to shout for the truth of the Hebrews, but you and I are not, uh, we're not in jeopardy of going back to Judaism. We were never in Judaism. Now, there is always seemingly a lure to go back to things that He delivered us from and that kind of thing, but I hope if you follow along with the Lord, you, you've been sanctified, you've grown yeah. in grace, you've matured, you can get to a place where there's no... There's no desire or diet for those things. Do I have a witness? I, I believe that. But here is the area of concern. I saw a, another race take place. It was going to be for the gold medal. It was a, a race between some female runners that were running for the gold medal. And everybody knew it was going to come down to just one or the other of these that would win. 
an American girl by the name of Mary Decker. And she was running against a South African girl named Zola Blood. And there were like 15 or 20 others in the race, but everybody just knew they were the two best in the world, and one would get the gold, and one would get the silver. But about halfway around the race, of all things that would happen, the two of them, their legs got tangled up together. One bumped the other, and all of a sudden, the American girl fell down. And the moment, how many of you know you fall in a race like that, you have no chance to win? And the image of it is still on my mind. She was crying, and she beat the ground. And she was obviously angry. I think they had boycotted, we had boycotted the Olympics four years before that, and so she had trained eight years for that one race to win that one medal. And in the press conference afterward, she was angry. She was bitter. She accused the South African girl of doing it intentionally. She was bitter and she was angry and she lashed out at her. And when I saw that, my mind went back to a race I had seen even some years before that. When there was an American by the name of Jim Ryan from Wichita, Kansas. He was the first man to, to run the mile race in less than uh, uh, four minutes. And he was running in a, the mile run. And he was the heavy favorite to win. Some of you may remember this. As he was running, though, he did the same thing. He slipped and he fell to the ground. But you know what I saw? He got up. He got up. And he kept running. And he finished the race. You say, what place did he finish? He finished last. He, he couldn't catch anybody once you fall. But he finished. But they asked him after the race, why did you get up? And you know what? He said, I did not train four years of my life not to finish this race. <laughs> and these two images are in my mind. I think about a, I think about a girl so bitter and so angry because somebody bumped her in the race. But another one said, oh, I just caught up and I wanted to finish. Here's what, here's what you and I have got to guard against. Because I'm seeing so many people go back. They're going back to this world. They're leaving Jesus Christ. But you know why? It's because they've been hurt. They've been bumped. They've been bruised. Somebody said something. Somebody did something. Somebody implied something. Somebody insinuated something. How many of you know, it doesn't matter if you've been saved 40 years or 40 days. If you're in the church, you're going to get bumped along the race. Somebody's going to say something. It might be intentionally. A lot of times it's not even intentionally. And you can do one or two things. You can let that thing get the best of you. It can become a root of bitterness. That's what the writer went on and talked about. It can destroy your soul and cause you to get off the race altogether. Or you can get up and dust yourself off and say, I didn't start this race for my Lord. Find out who it was. It was the boy's father. 
The boy's father is sitting up at the grandstand watching him. But he's seeing the son that's got a made up mind that's trained all these years to win this race and to finish well. And when he
here? Who's here tonight? And you say, I'm on the journey. I've got a soul out to the ministry. And I'd really like some saints to pray for me with me. To help me on the journey. Does any of you like that? I'm just step out. Come right here. Come right here. Come right here. Right up to the front. These people are